Netflix has gotten pretty good at doing true crime docuseries. And one that particularly struck out to me was Bad Vegan. Have you guys seen the show yet? Do you remember this story? It played out in the news and the tabloids, especially in the local papers here in New York, such as the New York Post, and was featured in Page Six all the time. It was a mind-blowing story of New York vegan restaurateur Sarma Melganales from Pure Food and Wine, which had become the number one spot for celeb spotting and delicious vegan food. Sarma is known as a very smart, capable woman who was the face of this business. You couldn't go in there without seeing her. A lot of people would travel from all over the country to meet her. She's a beautiful blonde. Eventually, Sarma married this sketchy guy, Anthony Strangis, a.k.a. Shane Fox, who for several years claimed he worked in special ops and said he had special powers, giving him the ability to secure a passage for Sarma to find Utopia and where her dog would live forever. I know this sounds crazy, but this is what really happened. Sarma ended up transferring almost $2 million from her business accounts at Pure Food and Wine and One Lucky Duck into her personal accounts to give it to this guy, Anthony. Draining the business of all the money and unable to pay employees, workers ended up walking out twice in protest. Ultimately, Sarma and Anthony ended up serving time in prison at Rikers on charges of fraud, among other things. After watching all four episodes of Bad Vegan, I think audiences really walked away not knowing if Sarma was a con artist or if she had just like fallen for the wrong dude and had a bad picker and was so psychologically abused that she lost her way. Well, Sarma is here today to tell her side of the story. She has a lot to say. We are separating one interview into two parts because the conversation was just flowing. It was so good. I'm so excited to have her on our show, and you definitely should make sure that you watch Bad Vegan so that you know a lot of, you know, what we're talking about, but I'm going to make sure that she goes through the whole scenario to give you guys an idea, if you've missed it, um, what we're talking about. But her story is so unbelievable, and I think she's the perfect guest for Misunderstood because she's someone whose story was narrated by the media, and she has not really had a chance to tell her side in her words. Today, we are releasing part one. Tune in on Wednesday for part two. Make sure you listen to both. So check this out. I hope you like it. And I'm so excited that Sarma decided to come on to Misunderstood. Okay, so Sarma, thank you so much for joining me. As I was just telling you before, you are someone that's been on my bucket list of people to have on the show because I think you are somebody who deserves to be reconsidered. Your story, I feel like, was really misunderstood. And for me, it was really obvious that you are somebody whose um, story really played out and was narrated in the tabloids at first yeah. and then was put into this documentary or docuseries that Netflix uh, did, which was a huge hit for people that watched it, for you probably not so much. So, at, you know, at the beginning here, I just want to clear up with you, what were your thoughts on the documentary? Um, well, I ended up kind of having to m make my thoughts very clear and outline um, the things that were sort of blatantly incorrect and um, clarify what they got wrong in, which I did on my website, um, and I debated how to do that. It was, it was when it came out, it was just... Um, kind of a it was like a fire hose in my face and I didn't really I didn't have any su support I did end up getting some some support but um, you know I think what happens is a lot of people see it and they're and they are sympathetic and they understand it and usually the people the, the people who understand it are the people who've been through something like that mm -hmm. certainly um, or a lot most people that work in entertainment and filmmaking they understand they see what what happened in the in the documentary that was kind of clearly um, manipulated um, I think the thing that was the most um, the thing that was the most kind of messed up was that phone call in the in the end of it in the end yeah because it was just so first of all it made no sense um, and it was really grotesque to kind of show me talking with him that way mm -hmm. um, you know it's like if you think back to the beginning when at the very beginning the show opens and it shows me on the phone with him and it shows that I'm recording him and he obviously doesn't know it and then you know I, I get off the call and I explain um, you know I would never record somebody without their knowing um, can I curse yeah <laughs> I'm like but that motherfucker fuck him mm -hmm. right yeah so of course if you think about that beginning it's like 
that clip at the end, obviously I'm recording him. Mm -hmm. I know he's being recorded and I'm playing a role and I'm just trying to, you know, get, get him saying bonkers stuff. And so all of that was basically for the, you know, it was for the film. I okay. was just, you know, a couple of phone calls like that that I recorded. Um, you know, one of them was quite long and he said all kinds of bonkers things. But, you know, I was definitely pretending and it, it just was so out of place to put that in the end. It like made no sense whatsoever. Did Netflix or the producers ask you to make those phone calls? Is that why you were doing it? Um, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I, I don't... I, I might have offered or either way, but like I was, was doing the it, show. I was doing it for the show. Right. I wouldn't have had those conversations like that with him. Yeah. Um, I think as a viewer, what, what, you know, was confusing at the end and why there was so much talk after the fact was like, after she's been through all this, if she wasn't in on it, why would she ever talk to him again once she got out of prison? So I think that, that was, just was the also question. something that I had to kind of, you know, be, I had to write all of that out mm -hmm. kind of point by point on my website because people were asking me the same question. Why would you talk to him at all? And that all has to do with, you know, longer story, but it kind of has to do with Leon because, you know, he got out of jail before I had to go in, mm -hmm. which to me was so gross. And um, my biggest fear, my biggest, I was terrified that he would go after Leon somehow, mm. my dog, because I felt like, you know, it seemed like his goal was not necessarily like, let me see how much money I can get out of her, which he did, but it seemed like his goal was more, let me destroy this person, you right. know, because he did all these things that didn't make sense necessarily financially, but it was like, as if he just wanted to completely take me down, mm -hmm. burn every bridge, um, just utterly destroy me and so what's the one thing that he could have really like really really hurt me is if he'd done it, it do some, doing something to Leon and he would have known that logically Leon would stay at my mom's house like mm -hmm. if I'm going to be gone for you know almost four months he he loves my mom he he knew that he would be at my mom's house it would have been really easy for him to like drive up there right you know wait nearby for my mom to let him out to go pee and, yeah, and you know something. whistle call him over and that'd be it so that was like my huge fear and when he got out it was just such a weird feeling mm -hmm. and I was looking at his social media because I was like what is he doing what is he saying it was just so weird and he mm -hmm. started saying things that were clearly like meant for me and so um it's it's a it's a much longer discussion and yeah. I think anybody who's been through this kind of thing too you're left with so many questions yeah. and you're like, even though you're never gonna, like, you're never gonna get those answers, you're certainly never gonna get an apology and you're never gonna get an acknowledgement, but you're left with so many questions that you're like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard, it's hard to, you know, kind of, it's hard to not go there. Yeah. And, um, and I knew too that like, if he was kind of, if he was reaching out like, wanting to talk to me in a positive way, I'm thinking like, well, for my own safety, for mm -hmm. Leon's safety, I would rather let him think that he's kind of still got his hooks in me. Sure. You know, and I can, you know, I could pretend, I could let him think that mm -hmm. he might kind of still have a hold on me and that's safer for me, you right. know? I'd rather know what he's doing, what he's up to, I'd rather. Um, so at this point when you got out of jail out of Rikers the only thing you really had left was Leon and that must have been scary right you had at that point lost everything I think yeah. it's important to let to take the listeners back for a second and just let them understand the story and hear how it unfolds so that if they haven't seen the Netflix or they have they can hear it through your voice um, before you started the restaurant you had gone to college, you were educated. Just give me a tiny bit of background about yeah, your upbringing. I, I went to like undergrad business school. I went and did what everybody there did, which was came to New York City, worked in investment banking, um, worked in private equity, um, then worked at a high yield investment fund. Mm -hmm. And finance really wasn't my world. You know, I could have stayed in that industry and made a boatload of money, right. but it's like I didn't feel like I fit in that world. 
and eventually I left and went to culinary school. Um, and then, did you want to be a chef, or did you want to run a business? Um, I just I always loved food and restaurants, and mm-hmm. um, that was like what I that was like that was what I felt drawn to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then I ended up working with somebody um, on his restaurants. Uh, And then we ended up opening Pure Food and Wine together. Were you already a vegan, a vegetarian? What was your, what did you follow? No, I I mean, I I never in a million years thought I would have turned um, vegetarian or vegan. And Mm -hmm. I never, I mean, I've I've never been, I've never really identified with the label. Mm -hmm. Um, But I did very quickly, um, it it was all the result of sort of one dinner and we were, um, this guy and I were, kind of exposed to it at the same time and we were working on a different concept to Mm -hmm. open something and once we learned about it um the more we learned and read about it and then also tried going raw not not just vegan but raw so everything we ate was like uncooked and fresh and um we felt like totally different people felt and I already ate really well. Like I already ate mm-hmm. a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables and I didn't eat a bunch of crap or junk food. And we just felt so much better. And um, and then we decided to do the restaurant. With that concept. Yes, especially because there was no, nobody was doing it in like a high-end kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what, that's what we wanted to do. And the vision was really, um, you know, to create a restaurant that appeals to everybody you know so it's good and you and when it was open I think on any given night if you if we'd like taken a poll like who here is a a vegan Mm -hmm. probably less than half the people I'm sure you know so many of our regulars just they came there the same way they might you know you might go to a sushi restaurant one night you might go for you know Indian food another night and then you come to pure food and wine and you have our food so people really appreciated it um, not just because it was vegan. Yeah, so, and I, I think that's important to to note because a lot of people that are not from New York and were not familiar with the restaurant maybe don't realize that and thought it was just this vegan place. But it was like a hot spot in New York, a place to be seen, a place to see a lot of celebrities. But not only that, the food was good. So you could eat stuff that you wouldn't ever eat at another time in your life if you were not vegan or raw. And you would be like, oh, wow, this tastes yeah, Great. it was really, it was unique. It was really satisfying. It was fresh. And we had, you know, we had a really good wine list. Mm-hmm. Joey, who was in the film, you know, curated an amazing wine list. Um, our desserts were like, were really good. And again, I'm, I can say like the desserts were phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I wasn't the one coming up with them. You know, mm-hmm. people sometimes would be like, you're such a genius. Your mm-hmm. food's amazing. And I'm like, I, at that point, you know, I could take credit for like, recognizing talent and developing it Mm -hmm. but you know it was all the staff and the employees who came up with the recipes and right um and so like i feel like i can brag about it because i'm bragging about them not about me (laughs) so and that brings up a good point you were not back of house even though that's what you may have studied in culinary school you became front of house you were really known as the face of the business people ended up coming to see you what yeah, was that in the like? beginning i was back of house kind of mm-hmm. and then you know there were periods of time where like I'd, I'd step back there and help out and so i was sort of both but i wasn't mm-hmm. like i wasn't the one creating recipes i would just work with them you know sometimes i'd suggest things or they would come up with new things and i'd say well maybe tweak it this way or that but it was really mm-hmm. um and i i do feel like i was good at recognizing who was really talented yep um because we never hired somebody from the outside. Whoever came up to be like a chef or a sous chef or the pastry chef had always sort of started, um, you know, in a regular sort of a line cook type position and then kind of worked their way up. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I mean, it really was, it really was a a special place. And there was something about that location and the beautiful garden in the back, Mm -hmm. which is unique because it's really quiet back there. Yeah, Um, It's not like, you know, so many restaurants in New York, you're like eating on the street. Mm-hmm. Now you're literally eating on the street yeah. with like all those outdoor spots, but even just on the sidewalk mm-hmm. and it can be really noisy, but that Irving Place location's oddly quiet, right? even though you're just like a couple blocks from Union Square and the garden's just beautiful with trees and we hung lights in the trees mm-hmm. and there's something about that space felt, um, you know, was really special. What was it like running front of the house? Um, 
Well, I also, you know, it was my role was so, I guess, kind of hard to define, mm -hmm. you know, because I, again, there were managers running, kind of running the front of house in terms of like scheduling and mm -hmm. service and all that. Um, but, it, you know, one of the things that I think contributed to my being in a sort of vulnerable state when um, I call him Mr. Fox mm -hmm. because he sort of told me his name was one thing, then it turned out his name was something else. Mm -hmm. And I don't really like saying his name, and so I just call him Mr. Fox. It's okay, sort of like a character. <laughs> but um, that's what I call him. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I had to do a lot of talking with guests and kind of that whole sort of schmoozing thing, which mm -hmm. wasn't something I natural at. I didn't love doing that. Um, but, you know, very often people would, people would come from all over the world sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. and so somebody would be like, oh, I came from all the way from wherever, um, you know, and they wanted to talk to me. So mm -hmm. what am I going to do, say no? Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time, you know, engaging with customers, you know, sometimes people I knew, regulars. So there's a lot of, like, being social and talking. And so that felt really kind of exhausting to mm -hmm. me, like just really draining and, um, um, you know, so I would just go home and feel kind of like depleted and, right. um, you know, I think what I really needed was like the, the kind of partner that helps you with the business mm -hmm. um, at that sort of like, you know, partner level. Right, sure. You, um, you felt like you were doing a lot of it alone. I understand that. So this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices, and the path forward isn't always clear. I personally have been through a lot of trying times in my life, trauma, grief, for example. I think those are universal themes that people can really understand. I lost my fiance, Andy, in 9-11, and the pain was unbearable. Since then, I've gone through other traumas that didn't feel as big, but I still needed to talk to somebody, and having somebody I didn't know that well but was really good at listening felt like the right thing to do. And it was so helpful to me. I love that I can have someone to talk to that isn't one of my close friends that I can just confide in and feel like it's between us. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. I signed up for this just the other day. I've already been matched to the most perfect therapist for me. I'm excited because I've already touched base with them and I have my first appointment in a couple days. So I will let you guys know how that goes, but I'm super excited to try this service. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash understood today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash understood. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash understood and get on your way to being your best self. So at some point, the guy you started this business with leaves or something, right? And then... Yeah, after the first happened. year. Mm -hmm. um, so we had just published a, a cookbook mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah, there's a whole story there, but it's <laughs> he left. Um, and so I was running the restaurant on my own. Mm -hmm. And then I also had launched One Lucky Duck mm -hmm. as um, we renamed the juice bar and the takeaway One Lucky Duck. We had products. We were selling them in Whole Foods. You know, it ended up being in like 30 plus Whole Foods stores, all these other stores. We couldn't kind of keep up with the demand. Um, and all these people would come to me and be like, this is an amazing brand and this needs to be, you know, national. And it was like all this opportunity was coming at me. And um, what was complicated is I had, you know, Jeffrey, the backer in the restaurant. Jeffrey but, Chatterer. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I had started One Lucky Duck kind of like on my own, okay. and I launched this e-commerce website. And really it all needed to be combined because the businesses were really intertwined, mm -hmm. and it really needed to be combined. And so um, um, I had found some people that were going to put money in and we were going to recapitalize, and, you know, I, I set up like a new holding company that would own all of it. And, and then it was 2008 when there was like financial crisis and so mm -hmm. people kind of suddenly didn't have the money they thought they'd have. And um, Jeffrey, you know, understood that I had wanted to consolidate everything so he agreed to sell me, basically sell me the restaurant mm -hmm. for um, 
you know, what had gone into it. So it was a couple million dollars. So basically I owed him that money. Mm -hmm. But then I owned and operated the restaurant all on my own. Right. Um, his company was no longer involved from like a management um, perspective. So you had some debt there, obviously, that you had to repay, but it was to Jeffrey. Yes. And yes. And, and I also, like, even coming into that, I had debt from my situation with the, the guy before. Okay. Because of his business. Oh, and you took on that debt? <laughs> that wasn't, okay. yeah, that's a whole other story. So, okay. um, but as it a seemed, result of. It, but it seemed manageable, the debt, because you had this asset now and you yeah, could make money. Yeah, it was manageable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was manageable and there was sort of, you know, it was it was understandable debt, the same way that some people have, you know, student loans sure. or, or whatnot. It's like everybody looks at that and they, they understand it. It's like, okay, you know, you're. So, and you were doing your best to repay this debt monthly or whatever it was, and you would go to Jeffrey Chatterow and you would give him a check here, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. Yeah, and he, I mean, he was. was so like he knew, you know, he knew I was trying to make the business work, yeah. especially. And then you know, it was two thousand eight. Like so many restaurants mm. in New York closed, and we didn't, you know. And I also, you know, a lot of that time I didn't take any salary myself mm. for a long time, so I wasn't paying. You know, I was late on my own rent. And, um, you know, but we made it. We, you know, staff was always paid. Mm. And I think, you know, because the restaurant was really unique, mm. it, we did we did all right. It's not like people stopped coming. Right. So. You and know. you were probably getting a lot of press for the celebrities that did go in there, right? I mean, I, I would see on page six a lot who was there. I mean, can you name some of the people that would come in often or that have been there? Um, well, I mean, the most memorable guests were like Bill Clinton you know mm -hmm. that was that was exciting he came in a few times you know Howard Stern who then ended up like talking about it the next day on the air mm -hmm. I think they put a little clip of that on Bad Vegan but mm -hmm. um, um, you know I saw lots of like musicians and actors and um, I think one of the things we did well too was that we didn't we were very careful about people's privacy yeah so sometimes things ended up on page six um usually that was sort of like bigger i don't know like you know, like janet jackson or yeah sure um i can't think of who else was in page six but um but we had a lot of really big names there and we just were very i was always very protective of them so sure. like i would watch kind of stand way back and mm -hmm. you know like if i saw another customer get up to like approach the table mm -hmm. i would just like glide in between and be like, can I help you? <laughs> yeah. Like, so I was really protective of, of people's privacy. Yes. Um, and we had a private dining room in the back, too, that sometimes we used for, um, you know, bigger names who came in that might want some privacy. Right. So, um, yeah. So now at this point in your life, you it doesn't sound like you were dating anybody, and you end up getting your beloved Leon. Tell me the story of how you. Um, got I was, him. I did. I had I had a boyfriend, oh, so okay. he was. Um, but it was such a, it was the best relationship, um, because I had I'd been through a challenging relationship with the guy who I opened the restaurant with, and mm -hmm. that was like very difficult. Um, and then, I I met this guy who was much younger, um, and we had we lived together for four years no drama we never fought he was kind of like an old soul mm -hmm. you know really creative wise mm -hmm. like such a good person loved his family we'd go back to colorado where he was from um and it was just a really good relationship and i knew i was sort of reluctant in the beginning because i thought um you know i was 30 i was i think i was 34 and he was 21 when we met okay and so I just thought, like, well, this is not going to work because <laughs> he's going to, like, you know, he's going to find somebody younger and, mm -hmm. like, that's that's it. And that's going to mm, that's gonna hurt. Yeah. Um, but he sort of, you know, he said to me, like, you know, he kind of made these arguments, like, well, maybe I'm worried that, like, some, you know, some guy is going to show up in a fancy suit and sweep you off sure. your feet. Because yeah. he was sort of a you know, like a young skateboarding kind of scrappy, really talented musician, but mm -hmm. anyway, just a lovely soul. And then he's also made the very wise argument that like, you know, we could both like get hit by a bus next week or a meteor could hit the earth. So if we want to hang out with each other, why wouldn't we hang out? And I was like, That's oh. a good point. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, four years we spent together. So, um, um, but I knew, I mean, I knew going into it that like eventually this, 
it's not going to last, mm-hmm. which was all right because I didn't, I wasn't looking to get married or have kids, mm-hmm. you know, so I had that sort of. Would you bring him into the restaurant with you? Did the all staff the time. know him? They all loved him. Okay. So he actually had for a little bit worked at the juice bar, but then we were like, ah, that's too awkward. And so I hired his best friend, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so also like his, so his best friend, Jonathan worked there became a manager, like such a good guy. All his friends were great. Mm -hmm. They were all friends with everybody at the restaurant. Um, He was there all the time. And I loved like, you know, I loved introducing him to people. I would hold his hand. I looked happy in Mm -hmm. his presence, you know, Mm -hmm. like I was excited when he, you know, sometimes he'd, I'd be at the restaurant and and he'd get off work and be like, all right, I'll come by. And he'd ride his bike over and show up all sweaty and I'd be excited. You know, it was just yeah. such a huge contrast to the way things were with Mr. Fox. Mm-hmm. So that's why, you know, my staff really knew like that there was something this is weird because yeah. it was so different mm-hmm. um, with this guy. And so, you know, but again, I knew it was going to kind of end eventually. And um, um, and then, yeah, in it was 2010. So we'd been together for about three and a half years, I think, mm-hmm. and that's when I got Leon. Okay. Um, which you know was really helpful because then we ended up splitting up, and having a dog is really it's really helpful. It's <laughs> really helpful. Yeah. yeah. So you have this dog. How do you meet Mr. Fox? You're single. You're working yeah. all the time. I was working all the time. I was really, I'd never been heartbroken in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I just never experienced that kind of intense heartbreak. And so I just, and I was overworked. I was just exhausted. I was overworked, um, really sad, kind of depressed. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I just would come home at night, spend time with Leon, and um, and then... I had strangely, like at some point before, befriended Alec Baldwin, mm-hmm. and we sort of spent some time together and um, became close. And then um, he met Alaria at the restaurant. Oh, right. Yeah. And actually, so I ended up getting Leon after I met Alec. And the reason I got Leon is because I was trying to convince Alec to get a dog. Mm-hmm. You know, I was so overworked and exhausted. Like I thought, I can't. It didn't never occur to me to get a dog. Like it just yeah. didn't even occur to me, and so I was trying to convince him to get a dog because I thought like, you know, he's alone. He, I was, I was a. You need to get a rescue dog. Like it'll bring love into your life. Mm-hmm. It'll. It's Why just, was he having conversations with you about being lonely, or did he come into the restaurant alone, or something? What made you? No, do that? I just thought, you know, I just thought he should have a dog. You know, and and yeah, he was single at the time, and mm-hmm. um, so I would send him. You know, I'd be like, this dog, this dog, this is a cute dog. And then I stumbled on this picture of a dog who was uh, named Quinn in a shelter. Mm -hmm. And there was something about his picture and there was something about it that I was like, I was like, this is the dog. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, you have to get this dog. Look how cute. Whatever. (laughs) You have to get this dog. And he wasn't really interested in getting a dog. And then I just kept thinking about this dog. It was like there was something that was grabbed me Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what it was and I remember one night I woke up at like I woke up in the middle of the night and I was crying about the dog oh my god! (laughs) my boyfriend was there and he was like yeah what's wrong and I was like I don't know I keep thinking about this dog I just I don't know what it is I keep thinking about the dog and um and then I had this thought this cat that I had that I was very bonded to Mm -hmm. you know I had two cats their brother and sister but the the boy cat we were like you know we had that thing Mm -hmm. and he died and he had died in March of 2010. And I was laying in bed thinking, like, this dog Quinn, they said it was five months old, March. Huh, he must have been born in March. And I just, I don't know. But anyway, so. The I signs g- aligned for you with, with Leon, yeah. Yeah. With Quinn. And it really, it's hard to explain, but it felt like I had no choice. Yeah. And so then I was like, well, I'm just going to print out the application. I'm just going to look at where the shelter is. And. <laughs> Just in case. And then I finally was like, all right, well, I just, I'm just going to go see him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, on the way, I'm just going to buy a collar. Uh, and then I, you know, I went to see him at the end of the day. And, um, um, and then I was like, okay, I have to, I have to get him. Right. And so I, you know, I knew I was going to come back the next morning. And, um, and I did. I came back the next morning. And I was like on the subway crying. I don't know why I was crying really hard because mm-hmm. I was so freaked out, like as if 
you know, early that morning somebody else came and adopted him, right. I would have been devastated. So it just was a feeling like I'd never had. It was like something was pulling me to get him. And again, you know, I lived in my office. So my sort of corporate office, I had like four or five people that worked in, in what would be the living room of an apartment. Mm -hmm. My bedroom was in the back and an office in the back. Mm -hmm. And we had product all over the place, computers, cords, stuff, like getting a five month old pit bull, really. <laughs> like, yeah. But I, I had to, um, and I got lucky too, because he, for some reason, was a very good boy and didn't, he wasn't one of those dogs that like chews up everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked out. Right. But it just seemed kind of, people would say to me, why are you getting a, you know, why don't you adopt an older dog or a small dog? And I was like, that's not the point. I don't yeah. want a dog. It's just that one. So yeah. Leon clearly meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I'd written this very long blog post about it, um, which I think, you know, Mr. Fox would have read everything I'd written online and then sort of really understood my psyche and what mattered to me and what was important to me and therefore kind of, you know, what what I might be vulnerable to. Mm -hmm. And so I think he later sort of, you know, weaponized a lot of that that information. Right. So let's get into how you met Mr. Fox. So then what happened was Alec joined Twitter. Um, he's very funny. You know, he's very witty and quick and he's very funny on Twitter and mm -hmm. he was he had just joined. And I think what must have happened is this guy, Mr. Fox, somehow, like, early on had some back and forth banter with Alec, who then followed him. And so by the time I sort of saw this person interacting with Alec, I sort of thought they knew each other. Right. Like, he must be safe. Right. He must mm -hmm. be safe. I thought they must have somehow known each other. Mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Mr. Fox, you know, red flag number one, was one of those people who you know, his handle wasn't his name, nothing really, there wasn't like a name and a person and a bio, you mm -hmm. know, very often, like, you know, I'm on Twitter, my name, my birthday, like links to my website, sure, you sure. know who I am. Transparent, but right. he wasn't, yeah. So he wasn't, but I just assumed, um, you know, it just gave him like some legitimacy that I thought like Alec was somehow friends with him. And mm -hmm. so we would sort of banter back and forth. He followed me, I followed him, DMs, and he just seemed very intriguing. So he would just drop these little things kind of, you know, implying that like he's somebody important or mm -hmm. implying that something that got me really curious. And so, um, you know, it started this sort of flirtatious back and forth. And then we started like playing words with friends together and then we talk and the messages there and then it went to like, then we exchanged numbers and we started talking and it was this long process. And then, you know, he'd show me like a, a picture that was kind of like half his face, you mm -hmm. know? And of course it was like angled in a way that he didn't look like he later looked. Right, so he looked <laughs> chiseled and stuff. He looked chiseled heavy. and had this like nice mouth and a, you know, five o'clock shadow. Mm -hmm. and, and then it was like a little more and he had sunglasses on and, um, you know, so it was just this like slow reveal, mm. which, um, you know, I think is certainly a way to kind of psychologically get you hooked or at least almost hooked the way you would get hooked on a TV show if you're like getting hints and you kind of want to know more. Yeah, right. Um, and he said his name was Shane Fox, correct? Yeah, yeah, Shane Fox. So, um, yeah, it just kind of went from there. And um, I think it was strategic on his part mm -hmm. to um you know to kind of keep up this communication for quite a while before we actually met in person mm -hmm. because by the time we met in person like he sort of did a number on me such that I got kind of hooked before I'd even met him right which is it's kind of embarrassing to admit that I felt that way but he got me at a time when you know I was super depressed mm -hmm. my already crappy self-esteem was like even crappier you know because my younger boyfriend left and right. moved to Colorado and all his friends moved back to Colorado oh. and so I just felt sort of like abandoned mm -hmm. and um you know I remember I like had this crush on this other guy, younger guy and he completely ignored me and so I just just like I was just feeling like crappy mm -hmm. and so um, you were in a place in your life where somebody could swoop in say all the right things and it would get you yeah and, and it would just be there. and he wasn't like he wasn't my type really mm -hmm. but he was such a contrast right so that yeah. like if I felt sort of depressed over my my younger boyfriend who 
you know, was very chill and easygoing and, um, you know, it worked so well because he wasn't like the jealous type. He was never, you know, he wasn't possessive. He wasn't jealous. I couldn't handle any of that. He mm-hmm. was very like, you know, I'd have business meetings with like men and he was fine with it, mm-hmm. which was great because I was fine when he would go out with his friends. Like yeah. it was a very, um, like really just healthy, good relationship. Mm-hmm. So, um, but Mr. Fox was like, you know, I'm a big, strong guy and sort of implied this whole military background and, mm. um, you know, like he could take care of stuff. And and he also, I think he fed me a lot of stuff that he must have known I wanted to hear. So, mm-hmm. you know, he would kind of praise me about the business and like, you're going to change the world and you're doing something so important. And, you know, it's so impressive what you've done and would really kind of build up, you know, feed that part of me that maybe wanted wanted that yeah. you know um so whatever he knew all the right things to say so he finally comes to new york and you meet in person yeah mm-hmm. and it was like not what i expected but it was just ugh. i mean i i write all of this stuff in detail in my book and i think i probably you know talked about it in the in bad vegan but um after that first weekend never mind that i slept with him gross i'm sorry <laughs> just like i don't but i had so much invested in it right that well at that point were you like attracted to his personality and you felt like you had chemistry i mean yeah that and and also like when i first happens. met him it, he didn't look the way he looked in a lot of the the you know he didn't look the way he looked later on mm-hmm. so he kind of looked like um he sort of looked like the way you know some football players are like uh, like especially meaty. the defensive ones yeah. are like really like meaty mm-hmm. and he also implied that like he'd had an injury I mean, he was of course very vague about what the injury was but he implied that he had like some injury so he wasn't like in his top shape you know and I'm like I don't want to be all shallow and right uh, you know so I'm not gonna be like oh you're you, you're blubbery like screw you but no but I've definitely met someone online and then you have such a chemistry in your personalities that when you meet them if they don't look like somebody you would say is your type it almost doesn't matter because you're so into their personality so I could totally yeah. understand although that. it's like knowing what I know now I would I would advise against that because uh, yeah. I feel like I feel like when you're in somebody's presence because I have found people attractive who aren't objectively good looking people sure because of like pheromones and because they're you know yeah. also their personality mm. but it's like it's like a chemical thing yeah you know and I think also um, when you're in somebody's presence, you might get that kind of something not right here. Yes, that you red know? flag might appear right. when and, they could hide it over the phone. Exactly. Or in text. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how soon did you start bringing him in the um, restaurant? Not, and- I mean, that's another, like, should have been a red flag for me mm-hmm. is that, like, I didn't want to bring him into the restaurant. And after that first weekend, I was sort of like, oh, I was really confused. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well... I guess that's not what it he's not really what I thought and that's kind of a that's it I just thought like well yeah that's it I'm not gonna see him again but mm-hmm. then he kind of you know those hooks that were already in there you know he kind of pulled me back yeah and um and then I, I don't know how long it was but maybe it was a few weeks later and it was like oh well, all right whatever and he came back and then um and then it just was this process of like because he didn't live in New York. He mm-hmm. lived in um, the town in Massachusetts. And he was very vague, and he kept saying he had to go off and do something for work. Oh, yeah. Work, he was very vague. Which was, what, in special ops or something? Did he actually say <laughs> that even... that's what he did? Or he, he just He was never alluded. very clear about yeah. it, right? Mm-hmm. And again, another big red flag. Mm-hmm. It's very convenient for sort of a con artist to say that they work in some kind of clandestine thing because you can't, like, go Ask on. Ask a lot They don't of have questions. a LinkedIn profile, yeah, right? right. And I remember even asking about why he didn't have anything online and he had some excuse about his work and this and that. It was all bullshit. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you meet somebody and you can't kind of verify who they are and what they do and you don't meet their friends and you don't see where they work and kind of get to see their history, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. huge red flag. Yeah. You know, just... Or at least you should find out about those things for sure and get some references, recommendations, something so you know exactly who you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point you start bringing him into the restaurant and your staff does not take well to him, correct? 
No. Well, the thing is, he's really he was very charming, mm-hmm. very funny and engaging. And so some people like, you know, Bonnie, who was in Bad Vegan, she's very funny, mm-hmm. like one of the funniest people I know. And so they would kind of banter back and forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and it was very funny and they got along. Um, he got along really well with Joey. Um, and so it's like he clearly tried to get some people on his side. Mm-hmm. And the same thing, he, you know, he befriended one of my friends mm-hmm. and kind of got that person on his side. And then if there are people who he knew didn't like him, he'd sort of find a way to, to get them, you know, out of your life. I mean, that's, yeah. that's something that these people do is they'll, um, you know, they'll find a way to isolate you. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, you're, if you tend to be the type of person that is kind of introverted and you don't have a lot of, like, very close friends um, who are kind of all up in your business all mm-hmm. the time, you know, it's like if you have that best friend that, like, knows everything about your life yeah. who, you know, would watch this happening and would see the red flags, mm-hmm. perhaps. So if you're like me and you're kind of more introverted and you don't have a lot of people in your life, like I got a lot of you know friends and people I was kind of close with, but I just didn't have time for a lot of that stuff, and I didn't have that like lifelong best friend. Yeah. The way you know my sister has that lifelong best friend since college. They well not lifelong, but that person that just knows everything yeah. about your business. Mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, that, that just makes it easier for them to kind of isolate you where nobody's pointing out the red flags. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he did that. And then, you know, he, um, yeah, it just, it just sort of like, I guess it started at one point him asking me for money. Mm-hmm. And I don't even remember exactly like what the circumstances were, how much it was. I remember it was on the phone. I remember he acted like it was just this like one off like I just need it right now and it's like almost he acted like it was like life or death you know and I'm like well I uh, I, I, I can help him I guess sure you know and then that's, at this point did you think you were in love with him were you married to him yet what how? no okay. no but I guess I did you know whatever whatever kind of hooks were in there you know, he did get me sort of attached to something. Mm -hmm. And I think... And you wanted to help him. Yeah. And I think what they do is they find a way to, they find a way to get you attached because um, what he did is almost exactly like what cult leaders do Mm. and the way that cult leaders will pull somebody into a cult. Um, It's just that in this case, it's very one-on-one. And so he sort of almost like in this very slow, deliberate, nuanced way, like eventually made it seem like all the things that I really wanted to achieve in my life and my biggest hopes and dreams, I could realize like he was gonna help me get there and he mm-hmm. could help me get there. And it um, and it like over time morphed into something weirder and weirder where mm-hmm. like he started talking about things that were not like normal. Right. Even like not very, of this earth, right? Like very culty. Mm-hmm. The whole thing that they ran with, um, you know, about like Leon can live forever, which they sort of exaggerated. But, um, and that again was not something he like came out with out of the gate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he's like it was just very slowly over time, and he would do these things that made me like he'd do things where I was like, how did he know what I was thinking? Mm. How did he know who I was talking to? How did he know this? How did he know that? And some of it I still can't quite explain, but some of it when I look back, it's like, you know, like eventually he got into my email. Mm -hmm. Another thing these guys will do is like, they're all over your devices, everything. Um, And so- So he would pretend it was, he had these powers to know you and know what you were doing when in reality he was hacking into your email or your texts to see what was going on in your life and then would act like he knew it all. Right. Yeah. Or like, you know, he might, like one time I think he must have read an email, quickly deleted it, mm-hmm. and then like said to me something about like so-and-so is going to call and then boom, the phone would ring and that person would call. And they clearly probably said in an email, like I'll call you in five minutes, mm-hmm. but he had gone in there and deleted it before I saw it. Things like that. You're right. So, um but yet, meanwhile, sort of more and more, I'm kind of like, huh, what? Confused and not knowing how to explain those things. 
Um, so yeah, he just kind of dragged me into a weirder and weirder place. And then like somehow, even after he borrowed that money and then I didn't get it back. And then I don't quite remember what happened, but there were multiple times where I was just like, that's it. I can't mm -hmm. deal with this guy. Like, and I would kind of mentally think like, all right, well, I'm just going to cut my losses. Mm -hmm. um, but then he would, you know, come back around and he'd be funny and say things. And, and then he'd be like, well, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you money, you know, like, and then I'd think like, well, I really need it, you know. Yeah, like, I, I, I want to get the money back. I don't want to lose that money. Yeah. I could have paid, you know, you know, I could have given that as a bonus. I could have done something for the business with mm -hmm. it. I could have paid more debt with it. Um, so I'd let him back in, you know, and then maybe he'd give me like some money, but then somehow by the end of the weekend when he left, like I'd have loaned him more money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's like the problem is that I don't, like I wish I could, I wish I could have somehow magically had like recordings of what he would say to me mm -hmm. because it seemed like whenever he was in my presence, like he would get me to do stuff. Whereas, um, you know, he deleted all of our emails. Um, he kind of took my phones and so I, I didn't have all rec record of all our text messages. Mm -hmm. I was able to get some. Um, but I actually was able to recover our G chats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people used to chat in Gmail. Yeah. So I was able to recover our G chats. And when I'm reading them, it's like, I keep talking back to him. I'm like, you're a liar. Fuck you. Like, just, you know, a lot of that mm -hmm. is in there. And so even me reading that stuff after the fact is sort of trying to make sense of like, but still, how did it get that far? Yeah. Like, how am I sitting there going, you're a liar. Mm -hmm. You said this before. Why should I believe you now? Fuck you. You're full of shit. Blah, blah. I'd be like making fun of him, making mm -hmm. fun of his stories. And then it's like, then I look at my records and it's like, you know, I sent him a wire for 50 grand, like these outrageous numbers. Right. And um, just it's, you know, over time, it's like your mind gets compromised and then you're sort of like you're trapped because what happens is the worse they kind of pull you into this bad situation mm -hmm. the more you feel like the only way out is through right and so and then it just gets worse and worse and worse and so I'm kind of like psychologically like you want to believe the thing because that would be like the way out where you get you know like okay everybody's paid back I have no debt. I can grow my company however I want. I can pay whoever I want. I can, you know, do all these things I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I and I don't have to answer to, you know, because I was also in a situation where I'd have a lot of, like, men that would come to the restaurant. They'd be like, oh, I want to invest in you. and mm -hmm. Let's grow your business. And I'd kind of get my hopes up. And then they'd turn out to be kind of creepy. Right. <laughs> like, and so I just, like, so badly wanted to be, like, independent and empowered to grow the yeah. business the way mm -hmm. I wanted to because it was also not a business that like I wanted to grow and then sell and do something you right know, this and was you like, didn't want a partner who could you know change your concept or somebody you had to answer to you didn't want to take yeah. money from some guy who wanted something from you right you didn't want and to even give. you know and even like I worked in private equity so I know very often when they invest in brands they put in a bunch of money, mm -hmm. open locations everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're not really what they were. They're not a special, you know, they, they kind of, the integrity is compromised. And then their whole goal is to make money and flip it. And right. my goal wasn't to flip it. I didn't want to make a bunch of money. I wanted this brand to be something that outlasts me. You right. know, I like tattooed the logo on my arm. Like, yeah. this is me. So, um, you know, again, it's like he kind of put that fantasy out there. And he'd always get me to like, talk about it and he would encourage me to like imagine things mm -hmm. and what I want and picture this life um and so um yeah I mean so at what point though did you start to withdraw from the business a little where your employees were like wait a minute this isn't the sarma that we know and you know that they started to reach out to you and say hey what's going on um you were married at that point yes yeah, and actually that was one of my problems. That was one of the things that really bugged me in Bad Vegan is because the director actually like spliced audio from one part of an interview with another part of an interview. Mm. 
that like in a way that was completely not honest because um, there's one part where I was talking about how um, I would talk to my accountant about um, tax consequences of getting a bunch of money because he would always make me think that like via some bizarre means he like had access to all these funds and so he mm -hmm. was just going to dump all these funds on me and everybody was going to get paid back and yeah, I'd right. be independent and I could grow my business and blah blah. So at one point my accountant had said um, you know well if you marry him like ha ha um, but that was like and then months later um, down the road at some point he he like convinced me to marry him but mm -hmm. I didn't want to marry him he, he acted like I'd be protected and like everything he was working on it would just be so much easier if I married him and he acted like I mean it's embarrassing but he acted like he was like part of this like you know it's like is it government is it like mm. this you know sort of like I don't even know what to call it. That's the thing. He always kept it very mysterious, but he acted like I'd be protected. Mm -hmm. And um, he always kind of kept me weirdly like scared of things that I didn't even really understand. Mm -hmm. And um, and just was like, ah, this would be so much easier if we just got, you know, if we got married. And the way that I finally like agreed was like, ah, fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's like, oh how romantic is that? Did he get you a ring? No, oh. I didn't care. I don't. Like even mm -hmm. if I got married now, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't want a ring, or mm -hmm. I wouldn't care about that. But um, he, um, and so we so went, it was not so some we, big love love affair. Oh no! And he we, got on so we went day. to um, we went to city hall to get the. I think you you get the you apply for the license, mm -hmm. and then you're required to wait 24 hours mm -hmm. before you actually get married. And so in the interview, I said, um, you know, I talked about this and how he sort of convinced me, and I didn't. I was like, uh, fine, 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 I'll get married. And I was like annoyed. And um, so we went to, to City Hall, got the license, and then within 24 hours, we were married. And so what the director did is he took that bit about me talking to my accountant, saying, my accountant saying, well, you know, he could transfer you money easier if you were married. Mm -hmm. And then I say, and then within 24 hours, we were married. Right. Well, that's not accurate. Got it. And what that did was that was like another data point that you know either something included or something left out that would give people sort of you know somebody watching that would question that or would look at that and think that I was like ooh I'm gonna get a bunch of money so I'm gonna marry him you know what I mean like it just is another thing that would would give people a reason to question my character right well um, you were either any way money. it just wasn't accurate <laughs> yeah. so it was like but let's be clear for people that again might not know this story he was promising you all these crazy things he had said he was looking at an apartment you guys were looking at an apartment for like 15 million dollars he went as far as you know putting in all the paperwork right and having some poor real estate person get really involved to the point where he thought you were going to make an offer and then the money didn't come through obviously of course right um so there was a number of situations like this where it got your hopes up that your life was going to be better and that you were moving up and he could pay all your debt and it was super easy f for him to help you with that and so uh he was you know giving you all these um things to look forward to and, and to count on and yeah. one by one they kept not coming through correct and part of what so part of part of the reason why I and and sort of people like me is like I can't I couldn't like I couldn't even wrap my brain around like pretending to buy a 15 million dollar apartment mm. and allowing me to hire a real estate attorney who I'd worked with before who I ended up having to pay his bill um and like brazenly sort of you know marching through the apartment the way he talked to the broker he got the broker convinced of all this yeah. stuff mm -hmm. it I thought it seemed like he'd showed, shown the broker something that verified that mm -hmm. he had the funds. And the broker was like, okay, you know, uh, the broker introduced us to bankers at Barclays. The brokers introduced us to, um, you know, this very high powered accountant. The broker was like, you know, doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, oh, well, the broker must have confidence that he has the funds because why would he have us go to this meeting at Barclays where yeah. they like, practically roll out the red carpet like we're mm -hmm. I don't know you know we have billions of dollars right and 
you know, we'd have these meetings with, with um, these bankers at Barclays as if we're about to dump, you know, as if we're like looking at, you know, what bank should we dump, you know, a bajillion dollars into? Mm-hmm. And I'm sort of like, the whole thing just feels so strange to me. And watching him with such ease, like mm. talking about this stuff, it's like I can't, I couldn't. It's ra- hard, it was hard not to believe him. Right. I didn't quite understand that, you know, now I understand that there's certain personality types that they can stand on a world stage, for example, mm-hmm. and tell the most insane lies and just do it so naturally and mm-hmm. not even like really care. Yeah. There's certain personality types that can do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's obviously one of them. But so most people will, um, w- like, you look at that and you don't think that, like, you're like, well, somebody, would he really walk in there and lie? Like, mm. I'm that kind of stuff, that would make me queasy. I couldn't do that. Yeah. And why would you do that if you were full of shit? And and I could never quite make sense of what was really going on. So mm-hmm. it was sort of almost easier to believe him. And also, like, if I didn't believe him, then he it's like... He would get angry, probably. No, it's like, if I didn't believe him, then he would be, like, the cruelest human ever. Mm. Because what would he be doing? He would be getting my hopes up. You know, like, knowing how badly I felt and knowing, you know, mm. that I was in debt and I was struggling and I would worked so hard and this business me- was my whole life. And to get me to, like, you know, because eventually it got really bad where he was having me borrow money from all these people and so I'm getting more and more in debt. Mm-hmm. It's awful. And to do that to somebody and make them think that, like, there's this, you know, happy ever after, like, perfect outcome of not just relief from all the problems that he created and then the ones that I had originally, which were manageable. It's like for him to do that would mean he's like, that would be the most diabolical thing ever. You know, it's like if you, you know, it's like imagine if you told a parent with a sick child, ooh, I have the cure and like just do all these things and like, and then, oh, never mind, I was kidding. You know, like you, I mean, that's not a great comparison, but that kind of like, who would do that to somebody that would be completely like insane beyond cruel yeah beyond cruel so i couldn't quite make sense of that so it was like well he can't cruel but also for to what end like it doesn't make sense why they would do that the motivation behind that so at what point though i think a lot of viewers and then just you know, to answer the questions in general, for someone who, I know people have said to you, you're so smart, how did you get to this point? But like for someone who had their whole life invested in this business and was so good at it, loved it, that was their life. It was like your boyfriend kind of, right? It was who you had a relationship with being at work and your staff. Um, I understand that because I have felt that in my past with my past jobs. Um, I, you know, I think I want to know how did you kind of relinquish that power and like stop returning messages stop going to the um you know to the restaurant and being there how did he have that kind of control over you well well one of the things about the restaurant was you know we were open for more than 10 years and even like before he came into the picture um, you know, if you run a business and you have people that have been there the entire time, mm-hmm. right? And everybody's really invested in it, like just because it feels like their family and everybody's mm-hmm. been there a long time. And so, you know, it, when I was with my boyfriend before, like I could go to Colorado with him for, you know, I didn't do it all the time, but every once in a while I'd go for five days, 10 days, and I'd be online and kind of in touch with everybody the mm-hmm. whole time. But, you know, I just remember coming back one time, um, like straight from the airport into the kitchen and just looking around and thinking like, and even saying to this guy, Ben, who was a sous chef at the time, and I was like, you know, it's amazing that I can just go away and know that everything's in such good hands Mm -hmm. and everything's running smoothly, everything looks good, everybody's happy, everything's great. You know, and I was like, it's amazing I can do that. And he said, he'd worked in other restaurants before, and he said, um, you know, I've worked in other places that were kind of run on fear. And he said, this place is built on love. Mm. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and it was that, it was like, it was that kind of place. Mm. And I, you know, it's like I felt like, the weird thing is, it's like I, I would, 
I did very often, I would do almost anything to protect that place. Mm -hmm. So the idea that he kind of got it all, you know, put me in a situation where I might have thought I was protecting it or thought I was doing something that would sort of, you know, ensure our future ended up destroying it. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he sort of pulled me away more and more. Um, and know. then did it become just hard to respond to messages where people were like, Sarma, I don't understand who this guy is or what you're doing or where you are. Did that, is that part of the reason why you would kind of go missing? The only well, when I the only times I went missing, one time I went where I wasn't responding is when he kind of told me, okay, this is it, this is the end, it's all coming together, like mm -hmm. this is all gonna, I'm gonna wrap everything up for us. It's like all, you know, everything is everything is gonna get paid back. All and he had me go to Florida for some reason by myself, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, stay off comms. You have to be off comms. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you know, he would always talk about stuff as if like. You know, as if he'd been like in the military, mm -hmm. um, and I'd always be asking him, like, "Well, can I talk to so and so?" And um, he—that's when the restaurant closed the first time, mm -hmm. and that's when the the employees walked the employees out. weren't paid, mm -hmm. and um, and like I wasn't responding, and then they walked out. Did you know that they were going to walk out? No. If I'd known, I would have like you know, I don't know what you know just done something mm -hmm. like got I don't know gotten back there and so, to be clear they walked out because they weren't paid because you had given the money to Mr. Fox right? I mean and all was, along and there was no money he was to pulling pay money them. out there was like money come you know it was like I'd barely make it to pay them mm -hmm. and it was just this constant like you know again it's like in cults where they're like oh the this big thing is going to happen and then mm -hmm. it doesn't happen mm -hmm. but then the people still believe it and they keep going and they keep going and so it was a little bit like that, like, you know, he would tell me, oh, my God, all this, you know. And you know it's hard to believe it, but you want to believe it. So it's it's almost worse to say, forget it, this doesn't make sense, because then you're at square one, you lost all the money, you don't have anything to believe right. if in. If you say forget it, yeah. like, you're not just at square one, you're like. You're behind, yeah. It's, and also, like, in a situation that you can't even explain, you can't mm -hmm. understand, like, what is going on here? Right. And so. You know, and he would keep saying like, "Oh, like this is it. You know, the the money thing's over. You don't." But it's like as if I was done. Mm -hmm. Okay, just this one more time, yeah. kind of thing. So it's almost like, you know, weirdly, because turns out he was gambling away all this money, which right. is just so gross. But um, it's almost like that, like what must happen. I assume, and I've always like hated gambling, mm -hmm. not just because it makes me so nervous and just seems very predatory and um so i've like i'm not somebody that likes gambling but i understand now that like if you were gambling and it was like all this stuff was riding on it and you gambled away all this money but you keep thinking like okay well if i just put this one little bit more in then i'll get then it it'll wash away not yeah. only will i get it all back but all the shame of what has happened here is gone mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so there must have been something like that going on where he would be like no 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 like this is all going to be over like well yeah you know all of this is going to come through and i'd be like i'm already in such deep shit right like this is terrifying like I, okay i guess you but know? he never got honest with you and said okay i have a gambling pro problem this is where the money's going just let me win this back one time it was no. never transparent like that. It was always no. about these Once mystical things. Once I knew things. he was going to a casino, he it's like it's like he acted like um, he acted like I don't even know how to explain it. He acted like almost like the casinos were like his bank, mm. and he did, you know, because eventually he brought me there, and I would watch him go to these slot machines and always win, always win. And I would see these other people there too, being like, this guy's got like a magic touch. He always seems to win. And he acted like it was some almost like magical power that mm. he could do that, you know? Mm. And I couldn't really explain it. And also when he took me there the first time, it was like everybody treated him like he was someone, which they do at every casino if you're a gambler, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, and I also like, I'm pretty sure, and I, 
I always thought that like more people were going to come out of the woodwork once Bad Vegan came out because mm-hmm. I feel like he has to have been taking money from other people too mm-hmm. at the same time. I think he had all kinds of different things going on and mm-hmm. I have some suspicions about it, but I don't know mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. But I feel like he has to have been working other people at the same because he would disappear sometimes for days. And I feel like there has to have been times where I feel like he has to have been getting money from other people at the same time. Um, and then, and I also, you know, I don't understand, like, if he, I don't understand the extent to which, like, he has some kind of a, like, illness or he's actually delusional himself. Mm-hmm. Or was this just some sort of, like, sociopathic game, you know, because they don't really care about money one way or the other it's like oh easy come easy go like it doesn't really phase them the way it kind of freaks out normal people that's why like sociopaths are really good you know wall street traders because that risk most of us would kind of freak out over taking like these high risks and making bets like that we would just freak out because losing would be so devastating whereas they're like eh, they don't really care you know Mm -hmm. and because you know having that psychology it's like they almost they need the thrill Mm -hmm. they need that constant stimulation so also like he would always play you know at at different times like he was always playing like call of duty or like different video games and the more i write about other cases and other situations that's very common it's like they need that constant like kind of adrenaline thing going on right Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.